here. I'll go down the line, Gosh, starting with Larry, the far end, who I just met. Um, Michael, Quince, uh, Maria, she looks like Quincy. Okay. Yes, Quincy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not so much. Quincy, John, and I'm Rod. And I don't know what all the genres here, but we're gonna fill that in in a little bit. Um, I like to start off always by saying, it's, it's always amazing to come to a comic conference. This is my third time coming here. And I remember the first time I was invited to come as an author, I thought, okay, who's gonna sit in a room and listen to authors talk about books when we have, you wanna go and see the artists and all the cool stuff at Comic Con. I'm always amazed at how many people actually come to this room to listen to authors talk about books. So thank you for coming. And um, so I'm gonna start off, I'm the moderator, I'm gonna start with a couple of questions that we ask that normally people always ask authors, and I'm gonna do it before you guys do because I'm gonna open up later on and you guys can throw questions at us. And, we're going to try to be as funny as we can and answer them. <laughs> so anyway, I'll start off for a minute. Before your book is published, who reads it? Michael. Uh, nobody. Other than the editors. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't use refrigerators. Really? Oh. Say it's an interesting answer. Quincy. Um, I actually have usually a girlfriend. Uh, as a, a pre-reader, I do now have an alpha reader and then a handful of beta readers that also make up my street team. So there's a group of folks who will read it before, unless I'm under a deadline that's really close or past, and then nobody does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Larry. Uh, I got what I call Reader Force Alpha. It's like my little core group of people, and because I write a lot of technical stuff, um, I got to get that right or my readers go mad. So I usually have a couple of technical experts on whatever I'm writing about. And then just a couple other people I trust. John? I have a writer's critique group I work with that helping produce what will be the first working draft. And then after that, I put it back together and I have a handful of beta readers. And then I go through it again another 10 or 15 times. Yeah. So do I. I do the same thing. I have beta readers, but then I have, like, my wife reads everything I write as soon as I finish writing it. And, you know, we always tell um, potential authors don't let your family read because they're going to like whatever you do anyway, but my wife, she's real brutal, so I'm sure. <laughs> she'll tell me. So. As long as I'm going to be honest. Anyway, yeah. My wife is not a fan. What's an alpha yeah. beta reader? Sorry, a new guy. Oh. Uh, same as with software. You have alpha, alpha users who are the guys who are, who are looking at the really, 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 really raw stuff. Okay. Your beta readers are looking at it in a little bit more refined form. They're picking up the, the little mistakes and stuff like that. Alphas will see the hopefully we'll see the gaping holes in the plots and yeah. those things. Gotcha. Logical fallacies. Yeah. One of the things I like to do is put the first chapter on the website early, okay. and then the people that are familiar with can come through and read it, and I get feedback that way. And there are always errors, there are plot problems, character problems, and I, ex I expect that. And then a few months down the road, I'll update chapter one again, and it comes back out. And I actually run a, a pay site where you can read the whole book, and it's rough edits. But that's not done a whole lot. But everyone has a group of people that they run it through that edits for them, be it grammar, verbiage, word choice, and then plot structure. And everyone reads it with a different eye. And by the time you've got to the beta reader, most of that should have been worked out of there just correcting issues that a new reader can't understand. Because when you're very close to the book, you don't see plot holes. And you don't understand why one person is wearing a red shoe, then a blue shoe in the next sentence. If you skip over all that, the beta reader is sitting there. And there are, do you do that for other people too? So like, you know, would you do it for him? Or? Yeah. Yeah, I, there's, there's a number of authors I work with uh, that if they have something they need to do, that, yeah. In fact, I'm sending a short story to a buddy of mine, the same reason I've, I've reviewed his in a novel that uh, he sent to Bain, actually. I'll say I'm going to thank you for a bunch of novels because like most, uh, most writers aren't gun nuts. <laughs> and that's what I did for a career before I was a writer. And so I get thank yous from a lot of writers who are scared of guns because, like, hey, Larry, make sure this action scene doesn't suck. And so it's kind of cool. Uh, Brandon Sanders was firefight. I got a thank you because his guns are a lot of stuff for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Um, did you have, still was an interesting one, did you have any formal writing training, Maria? Um, as far as schooling? <laughs> No, no, um, you know, just like, because I'm a language arts teacher, so I teach writing. So, yeah, I kind of guess in my college days I had to have the formal training, but there is no formal training for what we do. You know, I don't, I don't think, I mean, as far as the technical aspects go, yes. 
But the creative process, you can't teach that. You, I mean, you could teach how to pull out inspiration, but I mean, formal training, just the college nonsense, you know, or the technical. Uh, you know, I live in English class, and no, I have my degree is in history, so uh, learning how to research, uh, and that has been absolutely valuable. Um, one of the things that we do as writers is that we are translated with reality. We have to take the stuff that we either imagine, the stuff that we've researched, and we have to translate it into the language. Yes. Uh, you, we have to uh, translate it into language that the reason uh, you know, as such, being able to research, be able to understand a lot of different things, and then uh, uh, being able to put it out there so that you guys can understand it. That's what we have to be able to do. So any background that will give you that basic understanding uh, is very good. I'm going to add to that that a writer has to be a storyteller first. And learning the mechanics of doing writing is practice. You have to practice it and put it out, have it edited, because you won't get better if someone doesn't tell you what you're doing incorrectly and then you go back and readdress it. But you'll probably find that in most of them up here, the writers in my Excel especially, that you tell stories. I raise the children by sitting at the dinner table looking out the window and requiring them to tell a story. What do you see outside the window? And we would do that night after night. And that's how I had done what I do, is everything is a story. I can pick someone out of here and create a story around who I see. The guy in a Star Trek shirt is blue. Why is his shirt, yeah, I'm looking at you. Why is his shirt blue? Well, there is a story there. And that's how my mind flutters and floats. I can't go anywhere without something happening. My mind is creative. There's always dialogue going on in your head. A lot of voices. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, I mean, people would say we're insane. It's a cocktail because, party. Yeah, it, and it's, it's just a constant. And if you have that constant flow of that that dialogue, or even if like you're walking down the street and you're just talking narrative to yourself, there's something in you like to, to put it out, you know? That, Sometimes that's schizophrenia, but <laughs> I said they tell you to murder people. Best education to get is not a writing education because uh, honestly, the best education to get is something that will pay you good for the ten years it takes you to get successful as a writer before you quit your day job. I know a lot of us have accounting degrees. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to introduce the late cover that just came in, Trina Robbins. She's an American cartoonist. She's an early and influential participant in the underground comics movement. She's worked in DC and everybody else. So, welcome, Trina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, you guys are talking about getting started. Is that it? I because I think I have some comments. Sure. Just so. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can't learn to write. You can't go to school and take writing. You can certainly learn to have better grammar and better spelling, but the writing comes from here and it comes from here. And you simply have to, that's up to you. You have to perfect your own craft. Writing, writing is an artist. No difference than a jeweler, a blacksmith, a potter. It is an artisan craft. And if you, if you tap into the creativity side, that's wonderful, but eventually you have to get to the point where you can work the science in, and the science in is sentence structure, paragraph, pacing, point of view, and they have to blend together. So and you can learn the science, but you have to teach yourself how to do the creative. Okay, this next question is going to be a loaded one, so I'm going to ask the guys up here on the table, all of us, to try to keep this one short because it's going to be, okay. uh -oh. it's a tricky one. What drove you, Maria, you're the first one. Uh -oh. What drove you to write in your current genre? I'm weird. <laughs> that, I mean, that's that's the only... I think we all have that already. Yeah, no, I mean, you write about, writers write about what they know. And I've always lived, like, from a little kid, I've always lived in, like, a very dark, weird, kind of twisted place. And I don't see myself ever, you know, writing anything out of that. I don't agree that writers write what they know. That's what research is all about. Um, I love research. That's the most fun for me of beginning to write something is doing the research on it. 
Yes. And you know, and what you know, sometimes that can be kind of boring. Obviously, not for you. You live oh, in a no. dark place. No. Me, I don't. <laughs> I don't live in a dark place. So if I were to just write about what I know, it would be cats. <laughs> Oh, it makes, you have to have two. Michael? Um, you know, I write uh, science fiction and fantasy because at the time that I started, uh, that genre was the one that I had the best context to break into. But I certainly love that. It, it could have been mysteries as well. Because I love those, I just don't have the context in the, uh, the entree there. Uh, I, I, I write yeah. about five different genres, so um, I've got a bunch of different ongoing series. And, Basically, my rule of thumb is I, I write an urban fantasy novel every other year because that's the New York Times best-selling one that pays all the bills. And uh, so I have to keep going back to that because otherwise the publisher would like disown me. Um, but then I write epic fantasy because sometimes I feel like doing epic fantasy. I have a thrillers because sometimes I want to do thrillers. I, I got a science fiction series starting next year. Um, cool. Just because you know it's whatever gets your fancy. I find if we do the same thing too much. Uh, writers get burned out, we get tired of our stuff, but if we take a break and we do different things, we can always go back to our old worlds with renewed enthusiasm and keep the books fun. So I, I'm all over the board. I'm, I'm, I guess, every genre. Well, except for romance, I suck at that. You can learn it. And I'm good, I'm going to trip it. Yeah, but I'm friends with Laurel Hamilton. I'll never reach that. <laughs> um, I'm actually, a, I film myself as a cross genre author. So I'm all over the board because I have ADHD. Um, I, you know, it's, you, you write in one thing, then you want to try something new or play in a new sandbox. And now, the, the thing is that 15 or so years ago or more, Authors really couldn't do that and expect to make it um, because of the way the industry was set up. For the most part, when you got picked up as a publisher with a genre, they almost forced you to stay on that path, which made it a job and took some fun of it, uh, which has changed now. So yeah, I, I mean, I've got a series that's light sci-fi detective noir. I've got a series that's steampunk epic fantasy. Um, I'm going to be doing um, sort of powered armor, military sci-fi with psionics in it, and I, so I mix and match everything as much as possible. John, you want to answer that? Sure. I write, and I'm behind the curve on all of them, I'm not as published as much, but I write what I like to read, and I read a lot more growing up, and I would read these stories and had difficulties and didn't care for the character generation, or it was too militaristic. Why does the guy have a, a cache full of guns sitting here in the middle of Oklahoma? I never quite agreed with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it's the middle of Oklahoma. <laughs> that is the answer. <laughs> Why wouldn't he have a but cache full of guns? So, so I wanted to write more about the, the common individual that gets pulled into the environment. And I'm, I'm big on the concept that if you deal with a little bit of the apocalyptic world, and I won't say I'm writing death and doom apocalypse, I'm not. But there's always a something happens. And in those environments, the common individual, the common man, or the common woman, because you need to write from both today, especially, has the ability to become the hero. And they don't have to be the gunslinger going out and fighting zombies to be the hero. They participate in other ways. And so I always wanted to look at the books I read of how can you make it more character driven and less um, world building driven. Because I despise getting into six, seven hundred page books where 300 of it is nothing but world building. And it's like trying to read Robinson Crusoe. It's, it's brutal. you got to have that balance. you got to have it. And yeah. so I, I go from the character side, and I said, how do I make anyone sitting in the room be the hero? So, well, you just take everything away, and they're on the left, and they have to be the hero. Um, I think what you just said about writing what you like to read is perfect, because that's what I do. And, and sometimes, you know, you wish that there was a story like, Okay, vampires, but but what if the vampires? What if what they do is just, just they just feed from your brains, not your blood? And oh, I can't find a story like that. I'll just have to write it. That's basically it. I like whatever I write. I only write. I only write what I like. Is there a message that you try to send to your readers? Uh, you know, as you write. I'm not insane. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, the, the world's a great place. I, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of something. Well, are you place. saying, do you try and, you know, thread specific messages in specific works? Or, um, because I, I would say, for my part, there are certain stories I've written that, um, you know, I, I've treated with race relations, I've treated with okay. gender relations, I've treated with 
um, uh, caste systems, right? And but not all of my stories. Do that. Some of them, uh, like the one I'm working on right now for an ex-publishing anthology, tries to treat with um, speculation on where um, Medicare and indentured servitude might end up sort of joining. Right, um, and it's post-apocalyptic in a lot of ways. So, but not all. Some of my stories are just pure fun, right? Guns and mayhem and severed heads, and you know, because that's a lot of fun. <laughs> but even even within all of that, the guns and the mayhem and the craziness, there's underlying themes throughout. I mean, there always is, and, and I think as an author, you always kind of, you know, hands on Gretel, those types of things. You, know, you kind of give these little hints, these little whatever. Um, but there always there always is like a, a combining theme. Pulling heartstrings. Yeah. Um, my my action thriller has a strong theme of redemption. Right. And this guy is trying to save his own soul. Basically, I'm not so important, but that's what it's about. So. And I try to do it racial neutral. That I I will put characters in the book that are Hispanic, Asian, black, white, very white. Doesn't matter. And I try to keep a neutrality. Mm -hmm. And the, the one that's in edit now that you guys helped me with, the Fellows of the Tower series, Tom, I don't know if you think was actually a, a black man. Wow. Um, and it's never revealed in the whole book until the final two chapters where he is standing in front of the mirror and you get to meet him because there are little hints throughout the chapters of, of who he is. But I try to make this point where the racial issue of the individual is immaterial. And I'm getting better at making him where the the sexual orientation or the sexual birth is less of an issue as well. But the people are simply people. And why would I want to write a book that focuses on that conflict when I can create a better conflict that pulls them all together? Because the book has to be driven by the characters. And unless you want the main protagonist to have their own infighting, that becomes the storyline. Because you're always waiting for the next snide comment to happen. But if you can unite them, you know, go, go, Power Rangers. <laughs> then make the story become the group, and now you're a part of the member, and it doesn't matter what you're wearing or how you look, you fit in. One of the things about themes and stories, and sometimes you can go in and try to address the theme. Other times in stories, you'll discover a theme. You know, the first draft, you're doing something, and the character's moving in a certain direction, and, you know, in, in looking the book over and stuff, you kind of discover something that was developing there, and then you make changes to the earlier part of the book to kind of strengthen that. Uh, so that'll be there. But one of the things that has to be remembered is that readers bring their own biases to the stories. So very often you will have readers who have found a theme in your book that speaks to them at that time that you never intended. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's, it's a really tricky thing to say, you know, what any of us decide that we want to put into a book may not be what the readers actually yeah, get out of it. Right. You know. Have you ever been surprised by that though? Like, like you know. Oh sure, I, yeah, I absolutely. This, and then, yep. yeah. Yes. Just, just on, on message and theme, this is really important. Always put entertainment and enjoyability and story first, and yeah. then, because if you ever read a book that like beats you over the head with yeah, very special treats, nobody ever watched after school specials for fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Enter, enter, entertain them first, and then yeah, get your stuff. On the other hand, I um, I have done a series of written a series of graphic novels beyond the readers. Uh, the Chicago Land Detective Agency, which you'll be able to find in my desk. And um, I don't just make the characters multicultural, and definitely they are multicultural, but I really do want to get in a couple of, I hate to use the word educational, because everybody makes a and the kids go, educational, I don't want it. But you know, it's amazing how you can get in educational things without the kids even knowing that they're educational. So I like to do that, I like to just tell a couple of facts. Okay. I have a question. Do, have you noticed that certain sci-fi novels are trying to or deep, or kind of beating you over the head with politics, or is that just certain sci-fi novels? I won't read them. <laughs> I think it's just certain sci-fi novels. I I, I've gotten bad now that when I'm on my e-reader, I'll get into a two chapters and it's turning into a political commentary or they're trying to meet a point. I just stop reading. My, my time now that I'm getting older, is more important to me than the three dollars I lose on the book, and I'll just stop reading. I, I think there's a balance you can achieve both as an author and a reader um, to you know to wholesale eliminate them. Okay, that I get that um, because sometimes reading is for entertainment and escapism and so forth. Um, but there's a strong history of speculative 
fiction, right, in sci-fi that tries to look at where the, the writer's culture was, society was.